It's time to man up. My name is Caleb. I'm glad you're here with us. And today we're going to talk about an identity crisis that I believe most of us men are facing right now. It seems like our culture, our civilization has launched an all out attack on who men are supposed to be, who Christians in general are supposed to be, but specifically men. There's issues. There's issues as far as our identity, as far as being believers. Is it enough to just carry the name of Jesus Christ? Or should there be more dynamic? Should there be more dynamically? Should there be more of a supernatural change in who we are as opposed to just being like everyone else, just with a different name tag on? I truly believe that if we properly recognize our God-given identity, our God-given role, and our God-given purpose as men in this life, we'll truly find God's will for our life. This isn't just a clickbait title. Um, there are specific verses in Scripture, including one where it says it's God's will for us to give thanks. It's God's will for us to be physically pure, spiritually pure. But in general, this, I believe, is something we can apply to every man, every Christian, but specifically every man. I love the book of James. This is the first verse of the first chapter of James. James, as we know from studying scripture, is uh, commonly, as we know from historical teachings, what's been passed down to us and from reading the scripture, that James was the half-brother of Jesus, more likely. Um, if you look at the original Greek, um, it could also be translated, more specifically translated, Jacob. Uh, don't feel like you're being disrespectful to Scripture to call him James because we speak English, and James was an English name at the time this Scripture was translated. Um, James, Jacob, same thing. Cool note. Uh, if you look in Matthew chapter 1, we can see that both James and Jesus' grandfather, Joseph's father's name was Jacob. So kind of cool. Um, it wouldn't be a terrible thing to call this the book of Jacob. Uh, it's... it's it's called Jacob in our Spanish Bibles, Jacobo, um, but it's fine. James is fine. James is probably, and I would say most definitely, the first New Testament scripture that was written, uh, given by, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Uh, some historians say it's in the early 60s or 50s. I've even seen some say that maybe 48 or 49 AD is the most probable uh, time for the writing of the book of James, which is awesome. It's just, it's less than 20 years from the time when Jesus was alive and walking and doing miracles and teaching and, and preaching and healing and dying and being buried and rising again. And so this is written to New Testament believers so soon and so fresh after the crucifixion, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ and his ascending into heaven. And so this being the first, not in canon, not in the canon in the order of what our scripture is, but this being the first revelation of God since the Old Testament, it has to have a special spot in our attention and our focus and, and in our pursuit as far as how we study the Bible and how we attempt to live for God. The Bible says in James 1.1, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting. Um, we know who James is. And if you were to read this as it was written in the original Greek, you wouldn't read James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting. Now you'd obviously read it in Greek, but in the order that it was written in Greek, it would have been written as James of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, a servant. I find that very interesting because the first thing we're going to look at is our identity. What is our identity as men, as believers, as men of God? And James, his identity is found immediately in God and in the Lord Jesus Christ. Who is God? God is the creator of the universe. He's so all-powerful that he created all of existence without lifting a finger. He spoke everything into existence. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. 
in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, the Word was God, the same was in the beginning with God. Every time you read, and God said, let there be light, and God said, and God said, and God said, that is God, the very presence of God, not even lifting His finger to complete all of existence. And then the Word of God, the person of the Word of God, Jesus, created all of existence. That is our God. He is the ever-present being. He is omnipresent. He is everywhere at once, at all times. He is above all time. God created time. He cannot be subject to his creation. Just like when I make a pizza, I am not subject to that pepperoni or to the cheese or to the sauce or to the crust. It is subject to me because I formed it and I created it. God created time. Therefore, he is above time itself. That will come to play later in James God is the one who divinely led Abraham into his will. God is the one who led Joseph and allowed him to go into Egypt. And God led the children of Israel out of Egypt through calling Moses. This same God who led Moses to the promised land, to the very border. This same God who led Joshua through the promised land. All the way up to the point where he says to the 12 tribes, and even to the two sons of Joseph, all right, and choose you this day whom you will serve. And if it seems evil unto you to serve God, all right, time to make your choice. If it's such a terrible thing to serve this great and awesome God, this same God who, who anointed David, this same God who anointed the prophets with their fiery words of accountability and of judgment, this same God who so loved the world that gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. This is the God of whom James serves. James says, I could stand and say, I am one of the founding fathers, if you will, of the Christian church. James could say, I'm the brother of the son of God, at least a half brother. That's got to count for something. James could stand and say, I am this great spiritual leader, this fantastic writer, this great speaker. He says, James of God. There's nothing of me in all of this. This is all God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. He finds his identity in the person of Jesus Christ, who thought it not robbery to be equal with God. It was not a sinful or reproachable thing to be called just like God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of man. This, this tender root out of a uh, this tender root out of a dry ground, this lamb brought before the slaughter. In him is no sin, in him is no darkness. He is light and this light shineth in the darkness. He is the light of the world. He is the way, the truth, the life. Who made himself sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. This all-powerful being who made himself ultimately weak for us without losing any bit of his deity or any bit of his power. This is who James finds his identity in. And he recognizes him as Lord. He says, the Lord Jesus Christ, because of who he is, he has full right and he is totally entitled to everything that I am. Every thought that I have belongs to God. Every word that I could ever say belongs to God. Everything I could ever do belongs to God. I question myself and I wonder, I really wonder what my thought life would be like if Jesus Christ were Lord of my thoughts. If I regard it as every idle thing that ever entered into my mind, if I regarded that as the Lord's and not Caleb Martinez's, how that would affect me. If I regarded every word that ever came out of my mouth or even started to come out of my mouth, if I regarded it as words coming from the mouth of Jesus Christ through my body instead of just my words that I haphazardly toss around, how would that affect me? Would people identify me as anything different if I so personally considered myself God's property? And if I truly accepted the fact that I'm not my own, but I'm bought with a price, that the payment has been paid for the right of all my words and all my actions and all my thoughts. He is Lord of my life. And yet I so often 
dethrone him and I'd make myself and my preferences and my pride and my selfishness, my fears, my insecurities, I make them the Lord of my life instead. James found his identity in the person of God and of his Lord, our Savior, Jesus Christ. See, his identity was found in the power of God and in the passion of Jesus Christ and in the preeminence of our Lord. But I want you to notice also our role. He says, James, a servant. The highest calling we could ever have in this life is the calling to be a servant. Let this mind be in you, Philippians chapter 2 says, which is also in Christ Jesus. The Bible says in Philippians chapter 2 and verse 2, Fulfill ye my joy that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord and of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, verse 4, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, this mentality of servitude, which was also in Christ Jesus, who got down on his knees and wrapped the towel around him and bathed the feet of the man who would betray him. How he showed no favoritism nor partiality to the people he offered his services to, knowing that Judas was going to reject his love. He who tasted death for every man, knowing, knowing long in advance before the foundations of the earth were formed, who was going to accept that free gift and who was going to reject that free love gift. Let this mind be in you. The highest calling you could ever have in this life is the calling of a servant. Why? Because that is the exact same calling the king of the universe, the Lord of all, took upon for himself. And if we dare to call ourselves Christians and take the name of Jesus Christ and apply it to our own lives, we ought to also take on his occupation of serving. That is our role. Husbands, serve your wives. Fathers, serve your children. Brothers, serve your brothers. Sons, serve your mother and your father and your sisters. Serve them as Christ served us. How far should we serve? Well, Christ went all the way to the cross. He is our example. He is our identity. Does that mean we need to go commit suicide or sacrifice ourselves intimately in this way for others? No, but in like manner, yes. We should have an unconditional surrender to do whatever it takes to elevate and lift up others above ourselves. And you know, the funny thing is, if we all had that mentality, we'd be so edified and so lift up and our burdens would be carried by so many people all at once because we're actually doing what God commanded us to do and what his will for us to do is. Our role as men is to serve and our purpose. What is our purpose? Why are we here? Why did God allow us to be men? We could easily be women. In fact, genetically, we're half women. Half on our mother's side, of course. Where did... Where... where what, what is our purpose? Well, we must, first off, serve our God. How do we serve God? By sacrificing ourselves, by offering up our thoughts, by offering up our ambitions, our dreams, our desires, by offering up our abilities, our talents, our gifts, by willingly donating them, if you will, with no expectation of return to God's will. How do we serve God? I beseech ye, brethren, by the mercies of God, cause we can't do it in our own strength, by the mercies of God that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. There it is. There's God's will. Present your bodies that you present yourself a living sacrifice that we willingly serve as God served. 
Not only that, notice in James 1 it says, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the 12 tribes. So he's serving God's people. Your purpose in life is to not only serve God and to submit yourself to his causes as his son submitted himself to God's causes, but to serving the saints. That starts in your family, man. That starts with your wife. That starts with your parents if you're not married. That starts with your brothers and sisters. And then it continues on to your brothers and sisters in Christ who could use both accountability and edification, who needs the truth of God's word completely bathed and covered in love and mercy and forgiveness and kindness. We are to serve those who are around us, whether it be through a word of edification, whether it be iron sharpening iron, whether it be in providing needs for those who cannot provide for themselves. God has called us as men to serve as Christ served, but notice also serving the scattered. It says, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting, they're scattered abroad. Why? Because they are being persecuted. They're being persecuted by the religious elite of their time. Think of this, just 20 years ago, Jesus was encouraging them to do what the Jews and the Pharisees and the scribes told them to do. He said, don't do what they do, but do as they tell you to do because they are teaching you scripture. They're teaching you God's word. They have it messed up. They got it twisted in their mind, but they, they're getting it from the right source. They're just applying it improperly and follow their words, don't follow their actions. These are the same people that are trying to persecute the believers and persecute the church. And not only that, the government, the local government is literally killing them on a spree. They're in hiding. They're in catacombs. They're, they're secretly and silently holding worship. We're so blessed in America. We have no idea what in the world persecution is. James is speaking to hurting, broken, suffering people. And he identifies with them. In verse 2, he says, my brethren. In other words, I'm among the scattered. I'm with you. Of course, he also says, count it all joy. But before he told them to have joy, the first thing he did was he got in and started serving those people who were hurting, who were in pain. He was serving the scattered. It's one thing to get up and preach to people in nice suits and ties and ladies with beautiful dresses who get up in the choir and sing. They need ministering to. We must edify the saints, but we must also minister to the scattered, the people who are on the verge of of falling in their faith, the people who have been hurt by circumstances in life beyond their control, maybe within their control, but probably beyond their control, minister to the hurting. If God has given you any light, any revelation, any, revela bleh, any revelation, any truth, any, any solid ground whereon you can stand and minister and serve, don't waste that light, that revelation, that truth. Share it with someone who's in need. Find, actively pursue people as James did. Find someone that you can truly make a difference for. Guys, we'll never be the men that God called us to be, that created us to be, and saved us to be if we don't know who we are in Christ. We're children of God. We have an eternal, everlasting heritage through the sacrifice of His own precious Son, through the salvation that we have the shedding of his blood through faith in Jesus Christ. You must be a man like Christ was a man who wasn't worried about all of his accomplishments, his achievements, his accolades. He made himself of no reputation, took upon him the form of a servant. If we're going to be a man, we need to be a man just like Christ was, the epitome of a man. I love how the Bible calls him the son of man because he was human all the way. He was all the way God, but all the way human. In other words, if God can do it, we can do it because He did it on our turf, under our conditions. And then we need to do it because it's what we were created to do. If you truly believe God is who He says He is, then you must believe God's Word because God has claimed this as His own. And this Word claims to be God's Word. And if it is God's word, then we must take it as absolute truth, every word of it without exception. Because if the Bible says God is perfect and in him is no darkness at all, then his word must be perfect and flawless and in it no darkness at all. And so if we can take this word 
for truth, then we must take our lives as evidence of that truth. That, he's, that this God wants us that whether we eat or drink or whatsoever we do, to do all of it for the glory of God. That this God who says He can take all things and work them together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to His purpose, we must answer that call. We must pursue His purpose and fulfill our own purpose in being the creation of God, pursuing His will for our lives. My name is Caleb Martinez. This is the Owner's Manual podcast, vodcast, whatever you call it. I don't care what you call it. I just hope that it's a blessing to you. If it is, or if you have any suggestions on how we can better present God's word and apply it properly to the man of God that we know God wants us to be, will you leave a comment? Let me know what we can do to make things better. And uh, we'll hope for a blessing. So stay tuned. And uh, just remember, you're not your own. It's time to man up. <laughs>